Dialects Without Frontier has the satisfaction to receive Professor Cornelis Hotorf. Welcome, Professor Hotorf. Hello, nice to be here. Uh, Professor Hotorf is now a uh, professor in Sweden, in Kalmar, mm -hmm. uh, in archaeology, and also in conservation heritage studies. He has a background in Germany, he's a German, and he has been working in several countries, uh, including Britain, and also collaborating with Brazil and specifically in, here at Un University of Campinas with our uh, public archaeology lab. And he's a great specialist on heritage in general and specifically on the subject of our talk today, that is uh, conservation and destruction of heritage. So, uh, Professor Hotov, uh, my first question is uh, related to the definition itself of heritage. Because if, if we are going to talk about conservation and destruction, uh, what we do what can we define as uh, heritage? Well, I would say that heritage is everything that reminds us of the past. And that can be quite a lot of different things. It can be material items that are preserved from the past and still exist today. Or it can be intangible things. It can be traditions or certain cultural elements, songs or skills that um, still exist today. But it can also be um, features in our culture that may not have a correspondence to something that really happened in the past, but still uh, remind us of something that uh, is significant in relation to the past. Um, for example, there is literary tourism, um, where you can experience the heritage of an imaginary character um, in the landscape. And I would argue that this is heritage too. Like uh, uh, Robin Hood or... For or example, or Arthur in Britain. Exactly, or, or, or Shakespeare, that's uh, um, literary tourism in, in that respect. And since I'm in, in Sweden, my, my favorite example is um, um, Inspector Wallander, Henning Mankell's detective novels, which are popular throughout the world and are now guided to us uh, in the very south of Sweden. Or Sherlock Holmes. Uh, or Sherlock in, Holmes, in, in, in absolutely, yeah. yeah. There are lots of examples for that. So uh, the point is that um, heritage is more uh, a relation between the present and the past exactly. than something concrete, yeah. not necessarily. Well, then I if we define uh, this way heritage, how can we talk about uh, conservation and destruction? Mm -hmm. Because in a way, you are, you are implying that we are all inventing in the present something about the past. It happens, yeah. And um, if I address your question about conservation and destruction, maybe later when we come back to, to this point, then I think you can see that in society there's a lot of emphasis both in the public consciousness but also in legislation and in big institutions that the heritage needs to be preserved, it needs to be kept as it is. And very often the focus is very much on material items that can be uh, elements in a collection, um, artifacts or anything uh, you may find in a museum. It can also be a collection in the landscape. It can be sites and uh, structures, monuments that, that, that you find throughout the landscape. So that there is some kind of uh, fetishism about uh, uh, objects of the past. Well, exactly, I was coming to that. There are some people who use terms like fetishism, who speak about the cult of preservation, who even speak of the Noah complex, which is typical for, for our society. And, and what all of that really expresses is that it's something distinctive for our culture. It's not uh, timeless heritage. It's something that for about, at most, 200 years, uh, in our society has been valued and um, acknowledged and given significance as heritage. It's a social construction. Uh, and it will not last forever, um, but it's still with us for the time being. So that uh, if you refer to 200 years, uh, there is an implication that it would be related, right? It is related to the nation state, nationalism and, yeah. and, and all, even imperialism, so modern uh, concepts. Uh, from the Enlightenment. Absolutely. The, the, the modern notion of conservation is very much uh, connected to um, uh, national romanticism and um, the development of the nation states and that has spread around the world and you need to have a story about a common origin uh, in every nation state and we see that happening throughout the world and that also ultimately leads even to world heritage because it's the nation states that nominate the world heritage sites. And in this, uh, in this case um, there is also, there are several uh, scholars saying that uh, there is an intensification of this process 
in the last, uh, let's say, 50 years, or at least mm. since the end of the Second World War. Yeah. So there is intensification mm. of this process because, uh, well, the invention of the heritage concept, the world heritage, is after the war. Yeah. But then there is an increasing number of uh, monuments that are uh, uh, listed. Yeah. So, what's your take about this intensification? Mm. Why there mm. is this mm. uh, so mm. much mm. effort? Mm so much uh, attention paid to this. Well, you're absolutely right that it's uh, after the Second World War that really, uh, as you said, intensifies. And one of the key um, moments is the passing of the Venice Charter in 1964, which has really can, um, yeah, expressed this uh, particular thinking uh, on a policy level uh, very well. But there are different reasons for that, and I think exactly that's what we need to look at. We shouldn't take conservation for granted, but we need to understand what does it do and, and, and why is it significant today. And I think one uh, reason for that is absolutely the experience of the Second World War with a lot of destruction, and many people felt that what, um, mm. how, how they defined their sense of belonging and their sense of community, uh, a, a lot of uh, that was put into question uh, and all the familiarity of the environment had disappeared and they wanted to protect whatever was left um, of the heritage. But there are other trends also, there's the emergence of mass tourism, for example, which starts a bit before the war, but then uh, really takes off as people become uh, more um, affluent and also working hours become less and people start to travel and uh, then visit ancient sites uh, where they go, the heritage uh, throughout the world really. This leads us to the fact that uh, after the war, with the destruction of uh, city centers uh, everywhere uh, or in, in several places, uh, there was also not only the conservation as such, but as uh, re rebuilding mm. the reconstruction, mm. uh, ideally, of the former buildings, the mm. buildings that were destroyed. So, in a way, it's very clear that it's a kind of uh, new buildings following uh, pre-war um, salt, saltonment or pre, mm -hmm. pre-war uh, monuments mm -hmm. in, in several places. Even though in other places we, you have some modernist architecture mm -hmm. in London, mm -hmm. but also in, in Berlin and elsewhere. So what's your take about this? The two apparently mixing, mixed uh, mm -hmm. uh, trends. One is to mm -hmm. reinvent the old buildings and the mm -hmm. other one is no, let's Let's have a new mm. modernist mm. Uh, buildings. Mm. Well, I'm all for modernist buildings. I've just yesterday come from Brasilia and had a fantastic guided tour through the modern town in Brasilia. But the question of reconstruction is, of course, the central one because the Venice Charter was very much um, against uh, reconstruction and was already directly after the war, um, as these things were debated, a matter of some concern in the heritage sector, how you should engage with the, f with the possibility of reconstructing old cities. I'm thinking of uh, Warsaw in particular, which was the first case where, in a large scale, the old city was rebuilt uh, after the war. And there was a case then a decade or so later where it, um, it must have been several decades later, where it was nominated as a World Heritage Site and initially it failed. On the basis of that, this was a reconstructed town and uh, not uh, real heritage. And then later, uh, this was um, overturned uh, and it eventually became a World Heritage Site. And then there were several others also that, since then that have been become World Heritage Sites, even though they are reconstructed. And the motivation was always that it's the act of reconstruction that was being valued, not the buildings themselves. But the difference is very fine. Um, and uh, maybe because it was done too well at too large a scale that they just couldn't refuse uh, and couldn't say, no, this cannot be heritage. Now, today we see another phase, um, only over the last decade or so, where a new, um, um, quite, quite, quite a lot of reconstructions take place throughout uh, Central Europe. And they're often motivated by commercial interest, that a shopping mall wants to attract more custom customers in the city center and recreates the appearance of, of, of the old city. It doesn't have to be a shopping mall, it can just be the old, the ambiente of the old um, town. One example, which is nearly finished now, is Dresden in eastern Germany. Uh, they've been working on this for a long time now, and it's a citizens' initiative. The people wanted it, quite a lot of people, very well organized, very competent um, people. And what surprises me about it is that the heritage officials in the same area, they said, this is nothing to do with us. They said, we don't care because this is modern stuff and you may be as knowledgeable as you want, but we don't get engaged in that. And I think that is um, a grave mistake because they build um, heritage as we perceive it today uh, in a very sophisticated way. And I think we need to engage with that and um, 
yeah, work with initi initiatives like this one. But in any case, it is a challenge for heritage officials, this kind of uh, move, uh, because uh, you are uh, dealing with uh, some kind of invention, modern invention, mm. but on the other hand, it is uh, faking uh, sometime in the past. So it's an um, uh, ambiguous situation for, for a heritage official. But the past is always invented in each present. So even when the buildings are the same, you see them in a different light. So the difference is not so large, maybe. Yeah, well, in this case, uh, in terms of uh, for archaeologists, mm. because uh, you are an archaeologist and we have uh, a lot of experience about archaeology as being pure. Uh, so if you go to Pompeii, it's mm. the original city, these are the stones, or if you go to Rome, when they excavated the Via Sacra, and uh, mm. uh, they said, well, the, the, in this street uh, we had uh, Caesar or Cicero, so this kind of uh, fetish of this, the original um, street, uh, for example. Yes. So, in archaeology, what, what what is your take about the importance of this discussion? Well, I think you're, uh, without saying it, you uh, we're um, approaching the term of authenticity, and this is of course something very important uh, in heritage, and it's all about the a sense of trust that you can trust the place that this is the genuine place or the general thing. Um, that really comes from the past. But authenticity can be um, defined in many different ways. Um, and we are used to defining it in terms of material substance, that the actual fabric is the same. But it doesn't need to be like that. And there are um, heritage sites um, where there's actually nothing left, no material substance, but you still get this thrill, the sense that something important um, happened here, that uh, an historic event took place, maybe a, a battlefield or a birthplace of a famous person or something like that. So I would argue that the sense of authenticity, the aura of the place that comes from the onlooker, from the people who are appreciating the place, it doesn't come from the place itself. So the, how, how much is actually preserved um, is not so important as, as is often assumed. It's the story that is being told about the place and the way it's done, the sophistication in, in which the story is told. Uh, but in archaeology, in an archaeological lab, for example, and even in museums, mm. there is this whole fetish about using uh, not touching uh, archaeological artifacts, not touching mm. uh, the walls or mm. whatever, so that you must preserve the the pristine object yeah. that is there. And, so. and, and that's a, <laughs> uh, a, um, a practical performance in, in which value is established because uh, it's not the case that you can't touch them because they're valuable, it's rather the other way around. Because you can't touch them, they're valuable. Uh, so it tells a story to the visitor if it says don't touch. It, may, it gives its importance, significance to, to a particular item. And, and I think that is what is significant in this, in this case. Uh, this clashes, this kind of uh, fetishist approach, mm -hmm. clashes, for example, with another modern principle of uh, social inclusion, for example, of people with deficiencies, mm -hmm. uh, uh, sure. visual deficiencies, for example, so that you must uh, have some guided tours for them. Mm -hmm. And this clashes with this mm -hmm. kind of uh, yeah. fetishism. Yeah, of course. I think one can be a lot more relaxed about this. And it's, it's a way of telling a story for different audiences. Obviously, you use different means. Um, but I think you should be open to explore whatever seems appropriate in, in, in the given situation. Well, Professor Cornelius Holtorf, I would like to thank you very much for coming to our show. I'm sure that the public is much more informed about uh, the heritage in general and specifically mm. on conservation and destruction and the, the real value of those concepts. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having me. Uh, I remember all the uh, people that uh, the public that uh, in the site of the RTV station, all the uh, programs of Dialogue Without Frontiers are available for download. And I invite everybody to the next issue of Dialogue Without Borders.